I signed in at the front gate to get into the facility at 10 o'clock. And the 911 call went like at 10.15. I just remember seeing like a blue-green flame. Kind of like in the movie, slow motion. Boom. Boom. It powdered my skull like flour from like right here up to here. I got a titanium mesh in there. Killed a guy that was standing outside of the building. It took like 42 minutes or so from the time the 911 call went to the first responders to get there. And you're unconscious the whole time. You're dead? What's up, guys? Compound Coalition, and I have my friend Lance Manning here from TRB EDC, which is uh, no longer, which has now become Nomadic Soap Company. Right. But uh, I've known Lance for thirty years, probably at least. At least. Yeah. So how 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 did we meet? Let's just start at the very beginning. We met at um, I believe it was Del Mar Gun Show. Come closer to your mic. Try to try to match my sound. Okay. There we go. I believe at Del Mar Gun Show, wasn't it? I think so. Um. You were there selling gear. We hadn't met, and you had some, uh, you had some T-shirts that were pretty high speed looking. Um, and I was there selling knives and stuff, just kind of getting around, looking at gear and everything else. And that's how we met. You were kind of doing it pirate, right? You didn't oh, actually yeah. have a table, right? Yeah, no, I wasn't. I wasn't official like you. I don't know that I was official. I mean, we did sneak into a lot of places <laughs> together that we were not um, supposed to be. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so we just got to talking, and you started. I showed showed you the knife. I think I can't remember what knife it was. It was like the new big hoo-ya. Um And then I was like, "Well, fuck the knife. We'll start looking at your gear." You know? Yeah. Didn't you have a, a deal with Motang or something? Yeah. You had a wholesale account or something. Yeah, I would. So what I would do is, um, I would sell Oakley's folders, fixed blades, and stuff like that. You know, to guys in the recon community and mm-hmm. so forth. Um, because, and it was before, like, I guess now, you know, you can go to oakley.com or whatever if you're... Gov deal shit, yeah. Exactly. But before any of that existed, I was doing that, you know, so guys would have their cool guy glasses and everything else. Were you um, making any money doing that? A little bit, yeah. Were you, were you well, making... Well, absolutely. I mean, for a, for a guy, in the, you know, a young enlisted guy in the Marine Corps and everything, absolutely, I was making... Were you making more money doing that than um, the Marine Corps was paying you? No. Okay. Uh, no, it was just it was just supplement. Like it was that because I mean honestly, I wasn't in the Marine Corps to sell knives and sunglasses and shit. I was in the Marine Corps to learn how to kill people and shit or whatever you know, do my deal. So I mean that was my my primary thing. This was just a spare time kind of deal. I didn't really try to cross that line. Do you think there's a point when you're like, man, I can make more money doing this? Maybe I should do this instead of the Marine Corps. Um. Honestly, no. I don't think so. Even when you decided you wanted to become a cowboy? Well, I've always been Lance a little caballero. But you that's know what I'm talking t- about, right? When you bought that fucking racehorse. Oh, yeah. Lawsuit. Well, lawsuit, yeah. Did oh, it cause any lawsuits? <laughs> I don't know. That fucker kicked me in the chest one time, and I whooped his ass. I remember the first time I saw it, ate a 55-gallon trash can. Yeah. That motherfucker tried to kill himself <laughs> left and right. Yeah, lawsuit was... That was something else. He was fun. It was a lot of fun. I forgot all about that. No, horse. it wasn't any fun. Every time, I, every time the horse came up, you never seemed happy to have the horse. Well, the thing. Oh, so here's the thing about lawsuit. So I didn't buy him. I don't even know how the fuck I got him. To be honest, I thought it was the exes. No, the, well, it was ours together. Yeah, but there was this attorney that that had him. So he's like, "You can have this motherfucker before right. I get a lawsuit." Right. Right. So he, he bought thoroughbred racehorses and that's what lawsuit was. He was bred for mm-hmm. his, um, mother's name was like Laudine and his father's name was messenger by night. And his name was laudable messenger was his actual real name, his papers and shit. But they didn't take him to the track early enough. And then they never broke him and everything. So they're like, yeah, we got this horse. Can't do anything with it. You want one? I'm like, so, like, yeah, sounds like, great. <laughs> yeah. So we found a place to stable it and everything and took this horse and we named it Lawsuit. And Did you ever ride it? Oh, yeah. I broke it. Really? Oh, fuck yeah. I went to the library. I got a book. <laughs> I remember. I uh, 
I started uh, sacking it out, I believe, with a burlap sack and trying to spook it and stuff in the bullpen. Um, I taught it how to lope and it, or get it to. It probably already knew how. I didn't fucking teach it, but get to the command where I wanted to lope and stuff and everything else. Um, when I first started saddling, I mean, because it took a while to saddle it and get it, you know, and everything else, and then get on the saddle with it and everything. And uh, <clears throat> when I first started doing it, he was he was responding okay, but it was a little difficult. And there's this older cowboy there. He's like, "You get some fucking spurs." Oh, okay. Go down to the Western store, got some spurs. Wore those one time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he did not like that at all. Yeah. Fucking high ho silver, the whole nine yards. Um, but yeah, no, he was good. He got he got to where I could take him down. I'd ride it. So we were. Uh, where we had him at was called Rancho Del Rio Stables. I and remember it, it was kind of neat. Yeah, it was right behind the duck pond where the Anaheim Ducks played hockey and everything. <clears throat> and there's that uh, waterway that goes along there. It has like a bike path and everything else. And I got it to where I'd, I'd take him out and ride him up and down there, you know, um, on the bike path and stuff and everything else. And then we got to where we could take him up and Big Bear and shit like that and everything. But when we first got him, yeah, he was he was not broke at all. So did you ride like two up on him, you and... You and her? No. Yeah. Did you have another horse? Yeah, she could borrow one sometimes. Where I usually go by myself. Okay. I would go. I when I, when I get off work, especially like um, when we were running rip classes and stuff. You know, I, you you go down there and do different sections, different phases, and everything else. Um, you might be you know with the with the the ropers that you're bringing in or whatever. Three or four days, a fucking go take twenty four off, come back or whatever. I, w- I would go up there and spend some time with the horse and ride to decompress. Now, what's RIP? Uh, Recon Indoctrination Platoon. So that's that's their... And I'm sure that's all changed their, now. They were just dipping their toes in. That was the very beginning? Right, so... <clears throat> or was that a select... That's a selection to in order to go to indoc. That's a selection. To no, go to BRC. no, they've already, they've already passed indoc. So what we do, and I and everything has changed now. Sure. I mean, it's like they're like tactical athletes. I mean, they, and it's great from what I understand, the way it's all set up now. Because it's all MARSOC now. Exactly, exactly. And it, it's like a farm program, kind of like your uh, AAA team, stuff like that for Major yeah. League, I would imagine. So, um, But back back when I was in, it wasn't, recon wasn't a primary MOS. You couldn't go to the recruiter. Well, you could. I did. Hey, I want to go to recon, da 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 Okay, well, you got to go volunteer for that tryout. What other job would you fucking like? Uh, I want to go to recon. Okay, you can't, you know, a few times of that. So what'd you go in as? Uh, O three open. Okay. So <laughs> he's so like, you were going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, mean, I mean, I had a pretty decent ASVAB score, and I had several different opportunities, you know, options, I guess. So they made you machine gunner. <clears throat> yep, they made me. Uh, so basically, I went O three open, and upon graduation from boot camp, you go to the greatest needs of the Marine Corps, um, and I guess they needed machine gunners at the time or whatever. And that's so I went to heavy guns, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, went to boot camp, all that. And I'm sorry. I forgot where we're at. We're, uh, you went in the Marine Corps recon, but you can't go in recon. So they okay, yeah, went in yeah, yeah, open and right. they made you a heavy gunner. Right. So I went O three open, had to go to Marine combat training, which everybody goes through after boot camp. And a lot of times, sometimes what they'll do is they'll come there and say, Hey, anybody here want to try out for recon or whatever? We're going to have an in-doc, whatever. Well, that never happened while well, I was an MCT. Went to SOI, same thing. Never never happened. So went and earned my MOS as a heavy machine gunner. Um, and then went to 3-1, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, weapons company as a heavy gunner. And it was there. I was there for a while. Had to do a pump with them. But during that time, or actually, let me back up a little bit. Um, was there for a little while and then finally got a chance to go take the in-doc had been training and everything else. Um, went over to First Force, took their indoct, made it. Then you go, so that's the process. So you go to the indoct, and everybody goes to the indoct as a first-class PFT or a swimmer or whatever. And that's just like a one-day deal. It's kind of like a screening, so to speak, a pre-screening, really, I guess. Um, so you, you make it through that, and then you get orders chopped to a recon. And then you go and you're what's called a roper when you go check in. You'll get a sling rope, carabiners, UDT shorts, and whatnot. Um, like I said, I'm sure it's all changed now. This is just what I mm-hmm. was in. Um, and then 
while you're a roper in the company area, you run everywhere. You got to wear your sling rope everywhere you go. You run everywhere you go. Um, anytime you're shown anything once, it is now testable. So, like, if you were you were already a recon marine, and you saw me like, "Hey, roper, the fuck over here. You not a tie bowling knot? No. <laughs> now you do. It's testable. And then anytime fuck it, somebody stops you, tell what's a nine line brief? What's this and that? Da 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 da. So that's kind of you're kind of doing that while you're waiting for if you're waiting for a class to pull up. So you could be a roper for a little while. So you went to indoc. You went to the over to force recon. Did, were you trying to go to force? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do you do you remember the first time you walked into the compound where force was? Mm-hmm. What do you? Yep. How do you? What would you describe? How would you describe that? Intimidating. <laughs> right. They move a little different, right? Oh yeah. Because yeah. I had been around a bunch of. Like recon. Dudes. Yeah, they're, 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 it's a fucking so. They seem taller. <laughs> they seem yeah. bigger. You, they seem to stand up straighter. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It, yeah. Everything's different a little bit. It, it is. Well, I, and I mean, the whole, uh, the recon community mm-hmm. is a very small community, very tight community. And it's a different community than the rest of the Marine Corps. And I'm sure Marsoc is even more so, yeah. I would imagine. I can't say I'm sure, but I, I would imagine. It only progresses, right? Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely uh, an intimidation factor. So especially because, like I said, so when we started the end dock, we started at the pool because the water is the fucking great equalizer. You're going to lose most of your bodies right there. Um, and then, you know, we did the, the O course and all that stuff, levels test and runs and PFT and ruck runs and all this other shit. And this was all kind of... It, over at, um, I think it was at Las Flores, if I remember correctly, at the time. I don't know if they've moved or not. I think they have. I'm sure they have. I think they're over at Santa Ana Frey now or whatever, the new compound. Made. But anyways, um, so we're all in the compound area, and that was all, at that point, it was kind of like, fuck, I'm here, I better perform. You know what I mean? It, yeah, it's it's a whole different, it's a, it's like if you've never done a cold plunge and it's your first one, it's kind of like that, I guess. Um <clears throat> So go do the indoct and everything, finish that, completed the indoct, uh, got cleaned up, changed over into different camis, and then you have to go in for a oral review board, you know, just the one, whoever passed or whatever. And if I remember right, there was um, tables in a U shape, if I remember right. And there was about 10, 10 guys there, you know, all wings and bubbles and squared away covers and shit and just dips in and just, I mean, fucking fixed blades probably not, but I mean, but yeah, (laughs) Yeah. that, that, that deal. And so you're center, you know, position of attention and stuff. And they start asking you questions that you have no idea what the answer is to. They're just trying to rattle your cage. Mm -hmm. Do you jerk off? Do you do this and that? Do you da 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 da? If your team leader tells you to do this and it's that, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, just, just to kind of get a feel of who you are. Did you think you had made it at that point or did you, was it still questionable? I knew I'd made it through the, um, I made it through the physical part of the induct. Easily? No, fuck no. I mean, if it's. Was there a point in there where you, you questioned whether you were going to make it? Yeah. Were guys dropping left and right? Yeah. They have a bell out there you had to ring or anything? No, it was just a, so you had, um, you got a number on your arm. At the pool when you got there, if I remember right. And that was now your number. You were no longer, I was no longer POC Manning or whatever. That was, I was mm-hmm. number nine or whatever. Um, and like I said, you start at the pool. That's a great equalizer of the water. And this isn't drown proofing yet. Oh, fuck no. We're okay. just, um, this is just a, to get your ears wet, basically. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. We go to the pool, and I had been swimming like crazy. I was at, I was stationed at Horno at the time, and I'd go to the pool every morning, and in, in the evening I would PT before Reveille, and I would ruck run or whatever, come back for Reveille, help square away the squad bay, rake the sand and shit like that, you know, and then go to platoon PT with the platoon, and then do the work day and everything, and then at 1630 or whenever we got cut loose, I would go PT again and go swim again, 
to get ready for the end dot. Um, and even with all of that, it was still an ass kicker. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, there was 10 of us that went the day. So there was a, there was a buddy of mine in three, one, he wanted to go to recon as well. And so we, we, we kept each other accountable with our morning PT and afternoon and everything else. And he was a much better swimmer. He was a faster runner. Um, he could do more dead hang pull-ups and everything else. And he didn't make it the first time. He went and tried three more times. He finally made it on his third try, made the end dot. <clears throat> um, and everything. But the, the, the going back to the water thing, so I'd been practicing and getting ready for this and everything else, so I didn't know there was like a two-minute water tread with a rifle. and Over your head? Over your head. So that's different than just treading like this and keep, but arms fully extended, rifle over your head, it seems to want to push you down. And so uh, for the two-minute tread, they said my head was on the water like for a minute 45. And I was just under there with the, probably the rifle about that far above the water because it can't touch, doing my fucking egg beaters. Boom, 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 and then, you know, and everything. Um so, yeah, there was, and there was times in that. I mean, because you, you, you're you going to swallow water. You're going to take it in your lungs and stuff and everything. You're going to cough. And when that evolution's over, man, let's start to prepare to cross over and do another, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it, and it was just, it was just continuous, boom, boom, boom. And if you got, I think you got like three warnings or three yellow warnings or whatever, like say, if you didn't pass this evolution or you couldn't do enough push-ups or pull-ups or whatever, or do the O course back to back in amount of time, um, or the ruck run. Like, if you couldn't reach out and grab the guy's ruck in front of you, if there was more than that distance between you, that was a fucking warning. Three of those, you're out. Um, throughout the whole process, not just each evolution um, and everything. But I, I knew that I had completed the. Uh, the physical part because of the way it ended and everything like, like all right, you made it now go get fucking cleaned up and get ready for your review. That was, is racking mentally and emotionally because you're already fucking drained. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and, uh, so the oral review was, cause I mean, there's guys asking when, and you'll say something, whatever you'll move or whatever. It's going Write something, you know what I mean? And they're probably drawing stick figures and right. playing tic tac toe and passing shit back and forth or whatever. But it's just a mind game. You're, I'm, I'm sure there's some important to the questions and things and what your answers are. But it's how are you going to respond and react to this? Did you know you passed when you left there, or did they tell you later? No, I did. I got. Um, they did tell me. They can. Yeah. I didn't know right after my interview. I had to wait a little while. Um, but, yeah, I did, and then I got a, uh, I don't remember what the Marine Corps acronym is for, but basically a letter to my chain of command saying, hey. We own you now. Well, no, no, not then they didn't. Because still, it's a secondary prime, uh, secondary MOS. My primary MOS and the needs of the Marine Corps come first, right? Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. So I had to go do a pump with 3-1. They were doing their workup and everything. So, and here's, here's what pissed me off about the whole thing, I guess, because I, I got, I became the squeaky wheel for a little while. Um, like I said, I was working my ass out. That's what I wanted. That was the whole reason I wanted to go in the Marine Corps, was going to recon. Um, <clears throat> they denied me going over there after they sold the fucking indoct. So, and, and it's funny too, I was, I was talking with Parker the other day about this. That's your son. Yeah. For that's my, I don't know. Yeah. That's my middle, my middle son. Um, I was talking with him about it and cause he was asking me about the process basically. So we had a, a Monday morning or a, a formation and company gun, comes out there, you know, and has everybody. And he's like, Hey, if in, you know, recon's doing an end doc, anybody wants to go, it'll be this Saturday. It's on your time on you show up at this place and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, they really need some people and then they sold it. So Brian and I were the only ones from the battalion that I know of that went. And uh, I passed, came back with my fucking little slip, hey, you know, Willy Wonka golden ticket chocolate bar thing. And they said, nope. I'm like, fuck. And it was just, uh, they needed bodies, and I'd already, I was, 
I was a pretty decent Marine, I guess. Let's just say that. And they fucking kept me and wanted me until, and so then I started requesting mass. Hey, I want, nope, you can't handle it at your level. I want to go to the next level. I want to go to the next level, next level. No. Still didn't get it handled. So Marine Corps needs, you're going to go do a deployment. When you get back from your deployment, then you can go maybe or whatever, you know. And I, I wanted to continue. So we went to, we did a deployment to Okinawa and everything. I wanted to uh, keep doing it, but some of the fire had kind of died, you know. Some of the, okay, this bullshit isn't going to happen. You guys have given me an opportunity to go towards meritorious promotion boards like three or four times now, and I won all of them, but I didn't have enough time in grade, time in service. So it was like the senior Lance Corporal that was getting ready to hit the next cutting score anyways. They'd give it to the, you know. And so I was really, really kind of like, fucking discouraged to be honest about mm-hmm. it so uh finished our deployment went home went on leave for 28 days came back from leave to check in and the company gun you had requested mass again and everything else comes like manning you got your fucking orders you start rip tomorrow mm. <laughs> i just came off of 28 days of leave right not ptm right exactly drinking beer partying and everything else so, uh, looking like a food blister. Oh, big time. 12 sandwich eating food. Blister, you know? yep. So, uh, went and checked in first recon battalion and, uh, <laughs> like what the fuck happened to you? <laughs> right. Let the games begin. That's recon indoctrination program. Right. And, uh, everything. Yeah. So, and, and it was, it was a, it was a, it was now, a fun that, time. Is that where you go to scuba school and, and jump no, school and everything? No, this is just, uh, you're, this is where you're a roper now. You, so PT you, harassment. And- oh, f- this, everything is earned. Everything is earned. Um, and I think that's one of the things about like the Marine Corps, a lot of their preschools, pre-scuba, this and that and everything, their preschools, their RIP class stuff are harder than the actual schools because they don't want to waste a quota. They want to know if you're going to make it. Just like pre-sniper, else. yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's like, It's a Marine Corps thing, I think. Um, and I think it's a good good system. Um. But no, went to uh, rip class, and so that's just to say, whether you're okay, you made it through the one day end dot. Let's try this for a fucking month <laughs> and see where you're at. And so, you know, you have, uh, I think we had thirty or thirty one guys in my rip class that had all made the end dot. So I mean, these are all PT studs and everything else, and. I think at the end of the third day, there was four of us left, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, and that was it. I was, I may have been the cause. Of, so the first night, 11 people quit. <laughs> it just spread like a cancer. And uh, there was just a mass exodus. Boom. Um, I think I may have been the cause of part of that. Because one of our first evolutions was there was... Uh, we ran the O course like three or four times and then immediately rucked up with a sandbag and everything, you know, and went up like Recon Ridge, Iron, basically like a little five mile ruck run is our second evolution of the day. And we got to the bottom of the first hill. We started, I can't remember if it was Iron Mike or Recon Ridge. Anyways, got to the bottom and uh, staff or the cadre there was like, good, huh? Recon, huh? I'm like, Whoa, let's do it again. He goes, Fuck it, all right. <laughs> you know, that false motivation. Yep. Yeah. Guess what? We fucking did it again. And uh that was the last time I did some shit like that. But I mean it was it was it was a it was a it was a gut check, definitely. How long till you're in the surf zone with boats and shit? Moving phone poles and shit. Oh, you're doing that kind of shit right away. So you don't get into the surf zone right away. Like I said, everything's earned. So you'll do um you'll play with your boats. But you'll do water appreciation, and you'll carry your fucking cod or your stra- your instructors and shit on your boat everywhere you go and land. And then um, once you finally get to put them into the water, again everything's earned. So you'll do paddle appreciation, and that's where they'll put like a a one twenty line tied into the boat with like um, directional figure eights or whatever knot they're going to use along the line. And you snap link into it and you start. Pulling the boat around the Pacific Ocean with your instructor and shit, having boat races type of thing. Um, and then after you do that for a little bit, you earn your paddles. 
And so now you can paddle the boat. And, and you got the engines on, too. You just can't use them yet. Um, so you'll do that for a while and paddle up and down the coast and, and do surf passages, you know, and things like that, kind of getting used to that broaching boat and everything else. And then at the end, you'll kind of get to play with the motors and stuff, do, start doing some, like, uh, over-the-horizon navigation, uh, things of that surf zone passes. And, and so from there to full-blown, you're a recon marine. How long, what's that evolution? How's that timeline look? I think for me, it was about six months. Okay. So yeah. now now you've got your got your wings or whatever. No, 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 no. So, and that's what's all different now, too. You got to go. So now they have a pipeline. When I was in, there was no pipeline. You fucking in the Marine Corps are having the smallest budget and everything else. I mean, they're just, hey, we got one quota or two quota, you know. And that and you got to realize, too, um, so when I went in, the Marine Corps was kind of in a different state and everything. At the time when I got to uh, recon and stuff, they had, um, first recon battalion had disbanded, and they had, they became first LAR, and they took the colors and everything else over there, and it was split up into, I think, first Marines and fifth Marines recon for a little bit. And then they brought it back together as first reconnaissance company. And it used to be amphibious reconnaissance prior well, to that or after that? I think, um, cause you had amphib recon and then you had first force reconnaissance. Right. I but well, you had before that you had first recon battalion. Okay. And then when they got split up and everything, if I understand it or remember correctly or whatever. Um, and then when those two came back together, they came because LAR had taken the colors and everything in the battalion. Uh, we became first recon company. They brought first and fifth back together and made us first recon company instead of battalion. And we had, and the, and the thing was, it was, it was hard. So I think, I think we were supposed to have six platoons of operators. How many is in a platoon in the Marine Corps? The regular Marine Corps might be a little bit different. Like I said, recon's kind of a different little community. Um, and I don't know all the admin logistics. I was never, you know, the grunt. I was just a grunt following order shit. But in our platoon, we had 23, I believe. Okay. So we had three six-man teams, and we had um, platoon sergeant, platoon commander. That's your officer. Um, and then we had, like, a special equipment operator and a comm gear guy. So those were our, our headquarters element of our platoon. And then you had three teams of six, three six-man teams of operators. So once you're a recon marine, what does your day-to-day job look like? Your day-to-day job kind of looks like the end doc, but now it's just Tuesday. I mean, it, it depends on what phase you're in. I mean, there's different, there's different, tra- there's individual training, and then there's team training. And it also depends, like, are you working up to deploy you know, so you just kind of sitting getting, around waiting for a grenade to pop off, waiting for war. <laughs> no, you, well, innocent, you're practicing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're 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 patrolling. Like so, a typical week, um, especially like when we're in our workup phase, they're getting ready to deploy, and, and that's the other thing is like, so you, you got to earn your new sock special mm-hmm. operations capable qualification. So you chop and go to SOTG and run through the true program. You, right. You go through, you go through all that. You go through the true, you go through the reconnaissance and surveillance. So full mission profile, ship to horizon. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Helicopters, absolutely. collapse the building top down. Absolutely. All that stuff. Um, and everything. And I fucking, this is the brain injury. I lost track again. Where are we at? It's all right. We're just talking about you. You're a full time recon. You're a full time reconnaissance marine now. Okay, yeah. What's that so job day to day. Like? So during the workup, it like um, we would typically insert like if we were going to patrol for like we're doing, we would typically insert like on a Sunday evening after sundown or whatever. You know? What does insert look like? It depends on the mission. From I mean, from rubber raiding craft or we or just watch Hilo point or, or okay. Huey Humvee. Okay. Uh, I remember practicing fucking, all right, we're going to, we're going to do jump in and, and, but we can't get air and, you know, type thing or whatever. We're going to use Huey Humvees and so you're going down a fucking dirt road on Camp Pendleton and roll go, off. Go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Practice your PLFs you're and doing shit. 30, 30 out of a, <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it, it really depended on the ocean profile. Sometimes we would do that where we would insert, you know, 
via healer or whatever inland, um, if that was the scenario to get into this country or whatever that we were practicing, or we may need to come in and set up a, a beach landing site for the raid company to come in. And you've got weapons and everything, all the equipment. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going Hollywood. Carrying three fucking radios, 120 pounds of gear. Absolutely, yeah. So your six-man six man team, you've got three or four radios with all the batteries and all the shit. And Before you know, water and bullets, yep. Yeah, all your mission, mission essential gear and everything else. And then, yeah, the water and bullets, stuff like that. Um, yeah, it adds up pretty quick. Um some some missions, you know, like say if we were going to do amphibious, we would come in, do over the horizon. You'd sit outside, you know, the, the team would sit outside the surf zone in the Zodiac, make sure you're in the right location. Um, scout swimmers would get out, swim in, do a little box recon or beach recon and everything, find it, give a directional signal to the boat. Then the rest of the team would come in, stash the boat and shit head on end or whatever the, you know if we were if we were going into the hinterland or whatever just depending on like again how long were you is. how long were you in the marine corps for uh six years fuck it seems so much longer than six years yeah yeah i was i knew you most of that time oh yeah so yeah. so when you what made you decide to get out um that was uh so my last <clears throat> my last deployment my dad passed and he was like my best friend and uh, we were, yeah, let me think about this for a second. We were actually on our way home on deployment. And if I remember correctly, Saddam Hussein had manned the borders again. And so we got diverted to go over there because we were the closest near. Like anywhere. under power, like, all, like oh, all the way, we're going to war. Yeah, we're steaming. Um, I think, I think... He had something like, I, I don't remember that. I don't care. Sure. Anyways, he had man, he was causing, he was acting up again, basically. So we were supposed to go over there, show a presence of force, slap his little hand, tell him to get back type of thing, you know, or whatever. And while we were, when we got over there and stuff, I'm getting ready to go and stuff, uh, my dad was in really bad condition and uh, got, I think they sent like three Red Cross messages to get me home. And they all got denied. Fucking got shit to do. Did you guys go ashore? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, team. I think team two. Or no, team. I was in team two. Sorry. Team one. Roan's team, I think, did. They went and. Uh, Somebody left a message the other day on one of my videos said he knew Roan. Oh, okay. Yeah. Roan, great guy. Yeah. Um, he's here in Tennessee, yep. too. Um. But I got a, so the three Red Cross messages went across, and then a letter from my congressman or senator or something. Oh, shit. Get his ass home. So then I left and had to come back home stateside. And uh, then, you know, my dad passed and everything. How'd they get you from the boat? Oh, fuck. Well, we were, I guess we were already in port. Um, That's right. They... I got into a fucking taxi with a, a partisan link-up or a liaison who took me to the airport, walked me through every fuck. I just bypassed everything, boom, 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 put me on the plane, went to, I think I flew into Heathrow over in London or wherever. Somebody met me there, fucking walked me through everything, got me on a bus for like an hour or something to another airport put me on a plane there and they got me to DFW. Mm. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a pretty seamless, easy train. I just, he's with me fucking, yeah. you just bypass every fucking yeah. thing. Um, what's up, man? <laughs> we'll pause for a second here. Scully just walked in. Holy shit. You want to pause? Nah, we'll sit down. We're back. Okay. Where were we? So you were in the Marine Corps for six years. Mm -hmm. Got out of the Marine Corps. What happened when you got out of the Marine Corps? Where did you go? Um, I went to Dick Sepak and worked on, wanted to build Jeeps and shit. 
Yep. We kind of got into the off-road racing. Well, you kind of disappear for a while. You do that for a while. Like, you'll disappear, and then you'll come back, and you're like, hey, we should take your truck and cut it in half and turn it into something completely unusable. And uh, this sounds like a great idea. And I'm like, okay, that sounds great. Let's do that. Let's cut the truck in half. Yeah. So you, you're working at Dixie Peck. And you're going to, we had the, the blazer. We needed to put some ring and pinions in there. So you worked for the Drive Train Unlimited or something. Um, power Train. Power, power train, train Unlimited because we took my yeah. truck in there. You set up my gears and everything. Mm -hmm. And then you had uh, Mike from B2TW Balls of the Wall Racing. So we yep. end up, we going out to uh, MDR races. Yep. At like Stoddard and all those places. Yep. Um, Lucerne and all that. And um we go out, and that's a whole new thing that we're exposed to. Um, and you totally wrecked his car. Like, oh, fuck. knocked about ten thousand dollars lights off the roof when you rolled it twice. Oh, I did. I did more than that. And, I bit uh, the rear. <clears throat> and he was. He had a contract. He was teaching the seals how to drive those um, Chinooth buggies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, then you rented a storage unit in Tustin. And you're going to start a fab shop. Yeah. So you welded up these cool bumpers. Yep. For the XJ, for my Cherokee. And then a dude bumped into it, and my bumper fell off. And I'm like, <laughs> fucking Lance. I'm glad I didn't hit anything with that thing. Um, and then from there, where did you go after that? So from there, I went, uh, fuck, where did I go? So that's the problem. Like you said, I, I pop in and out and everything. Okay. So you um, want you, you somewhere in the middle there. Oh, I went to, I went to, I went back to Kansas. And somewhere in the middle there, you became pretty high speed welder mm -hmm. and you were now doing boilers. And then you popped back into town and you had a wife and I think you had a kid at that time. We went to claim jumper and then I didn't see you again for years, like mm -hmm. years and years and years. I go to prison Come home from prison, I get on Facebook and start doing Facebook stuff, which didn't exist. And out of the blue, you reach out and you're like, "Hey, man, do you go mountain biking? I want to go mountain biking. You want to go mountain biking? Do you go mountain biking? I'm gonna come down. We're gonna go mountain biking." And come to find out, you're in a like a TBI recovery center yeah, or something, yeah. Center for Neural Skills. So let's <clears throat> let's back up from there six months or a year. Okay, you're in Las Vegas. You're working on a boiler. No, no. What happened? I was in Wyoming. Okay. See, uh, all, dude, all this time I thought this happened in Las Vegas. No, no, no. Okay. No, but I traveled all over. Okay. Work. I, I traveled all over the country, Canada and stuff, doing startups and things. Like okay. That, working on boilers. No, um, I was working on a boiler over in uh, Wyoming, and it was at an explosives manufacturer. Oh, shit. Yeah, right? Takes one to make one, right? Um. But it was over there, and it was it was it was really kind of a jacked up deal, and I don't really know what all the details or whatever. Um, okay, uh, and, and a lot of it is because I personally don't really remember. You you know what I'm saying? I I remember everything up to the explosion. Can we talk about this? What you remember of it? Sure, sure. Um, so the company that I was working for had sold this uh, new boiler and the package and everything to this uh, explosives manufacturer. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was, I did f factory authorized startups. So the company I worked for recruited me from this other company that I traveled all over the country and stuff, doing the stuff for and, and running service schools and things like that. So I was going over there. I was doing... Um, it was end of October because the explosion was on November 1st. And I was doing uh, a lot of school startups and getting their boilers back up and ready for winter up in South Dakota, North Dakota, northern Nebraska, and so forth in Wyoming. So we shut the boilers down. They actually go dormant. We completely mm -hmm. shut them off in the summer months? Some people do. Okay. Like, like the school stuff. Like Now, if you're using it for uh, your manufacturing or whatever, your hospitals or autoclaves and shit like that or laundry or heat and stuff, they don't, but a lot of the schools do. Could we put a boiler here? You can put a boiler wherever you want, I guess. What do what, you want to do with it? I don't know. What do I, why would I need a boiler? Um, all your power plants. 
So I can, I can use it to turn steam stuff to and, generate power? Exactly. Is that something feasible? Like, could we actually fab into the world? Could we fab that up and actually get that online ourselves? You think you could build a steam locomotive? Because that's what they did without all the shit we have today. <laughs> well, I don't know. Can you? I would imagine. I mean, you could probably scrap the stuff together. The the the, the technology is there. We you know, if you understand, what are we thing, moving it stuff. with? Clydesdales, mules, oxen. How are we getting it here? Build it. I don't know. Into the world, Lance. Go to the fucking hospital and get it. I'm looking at the motherfucker that has the answer. How do we get it here? It's the boiler. Yeah. How do we get the locomotive here? That's easy. They're already tracked up, sitting in fucking museums, just waiting for us to fucking pull them out. There you go. Okay. But so, I mean, okay, so, so, the best Western in town has a boiler. What? Fuck yeah! They probably have a couple, a backup and stuff. Did you see the old man working inside? No. But I'm just saying, most of your your hotels and stuff like that, because for their laundry, you know, for the their old, hot water, the old man inside. You know what he used to do? Mm-mm. Started up power plants. Oh really? Went and shut down power plants when they were going to shut down the the, uh, tr- the coal fire plants. Okay. He was part of the team that come in and shut them down and stand them up. Yeah. Well, I've done, I've, I've worked on boilers and for big greenhouses and shit. See, I knew when I told you I had and... another motherfucker, all of a sudden you'd be able to do it. There you go. All right. But, yeah, so I, I went to do the startup on this boiler. Well, long story short, they had to shut down, they had to farm out part of their manufacturing process because their high, st- high steam boiler wasn't online. The contractors and stuff and the plumbers that were installing it got it all installed and they wanted to come back online the week prior to me when I was scheduled to go there to do it. And uh, so they fucked around with it and everything else, loaded it up with propane in the room. I was there, I think um, I signed in at the front gate to get into the facility at 10 o'clock and the 911 call went like at 10.15. I was there for like 15 minutes, you know, get my tools out of the truck, this and that, meet the, the kid that was the maintenance guy there, um, and started doing safety checks and, and checking stuff to make sure that, it, you know, things were wired right and this and that and everything else. And went to check the, uh, flame scanner for a false flame detection that would, the programmer would lock the boiler out, you know? Um, and when I went to, cause you got to have a flame to check the flame scanner. Yep. When I went to check it, I just remember seeing like a blue gla- uh, blue green flame, kind of like in the movie, slow motion, boom, boom. And that blew was, the whole building, the whole room. That um, blew the boiler up. The boiler was. Were you inside the boiler? No, I was like, if the boiler was this microphone, I was right. Okay. I was like right here. So the um, the burner it blew the blew the burner off the front of the boiler which I guess hit me in the chest. And then I went back and through a wall, which is where I got my spinal cord injury and everything. Through a cinder block wall? No, it was a metal building. Steel, I'm, like a steel building like yeah, this? Yeah, which I'm glad I went through instead of hitting the fucking studs or whatever, the right, metal. The I, yeah, exactly. Um, blew the front door of the boiler off, which is probably, I don't know how many hundreds of pounds you know, steel it is, big nuts and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, that came off, and that's what hit me in the head because I was bent over working on it. <clears throat> and that's what uh, powdered my so I, it powdered my skull like flour from like right here up to here. I got a titanium mesh in there. Um, killed a guy that was standing outside of the building, just right out the the young the maintenance, the maintenance kid. kid. Yeah. Uh, Shrapnel hit him, took him out, and everything. It took, I think, it took like 42 minutes or so from the time the 911 call went to the first responders to get there. And you're unconscious the whole time. You're dead? No, I guess not. I, and I don't remember this. No, I was ambulatory and up, and I trying to help the kid that got killed. And <clears throat> when the paramedics got there, I guess I got very combative with them. And they looked and they're like, fuck. And so they put me under, life lighted me out. I don't remember any of that. That's just what. You had I a Strider did. knife with you then? Yeah. Did, did. Do you have that knife? 
I believe so too. Because it got lost in the field. They found it out in the field. Do you it's remember? the buck. It's the buck knife or whatever. Yeah. 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 No, I have it at home. The the one of the prototypes. Who that. gave you that back? Like how did how did you end up with that? Because it came off of you. It was lost for some time. Um. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So from from the accident happening from the incident. Mm-hmm. When, what do you remember? How far do until you remember something? How long was that? In the hospital. How long was that? What like how how long are we talking? The first thing that I actually personally remember. Yeah. A uh, couple days. Okay. Afterwards. And they had you <clears throat> under probably. Were you unconscious? Um, or they had you sedated. No, I I'd already so I'd already had my surgery my for my open head wound and everything else and all that. Um, no, I was in, I was in the hospital room in recovery there after the surgery and stuff. And they were trying to assess the damage and they didn't know to what degree cognitively I had been impacted. And so, um, they took me, they took me into a room with a psychiatrist or whatever, psychologist, whatever, and ran me through a battery of test. And there was like, I don't know, several tests. Um, one of them was like, seriously, like C spot run was the mm-hmm. book they gave me to read to him. And I could like read the words, but I couldn't tell you who the fuck spot was, what he was doing or anything. Um, so I failed that one. There was a simple addition, subtraction stuff, <clears throat> you know, like two plus two. And I remembered that because Mason was four at the time. And I was working with him on learning math, and I couldn't do it. But I could look at it and go, fuck, I know my son can do this, but I couldn't do it. So I failed that one, went through a lot of these things, and the very last one they gave me was they had um, these jumbo playing cards. Jumbo side, but they were a picture of a snowman. One was a complete snowman, one was a puddle with all the shit in it, and the other one's a process of it melting. Yep. And I had to put them in the right sequential order and I couldn't do it and uh, <clears throat> so the doctor was like basically told me you're fucked up this is your life da, 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 you know blah blah and I just I went off on him I was like I was pissed and I started cussing him out in Morse code did it da, did it da, did it da, did, you know mm-hmm. he was like what the fuck are you doing and I was like well how come I can do that but I can't do this shit and everything you know and so that's the, the first, um, he's, he didn't have an answer and an explanation for me. Um, and this is also before. Are you in Wyoming? Yes. Is yeah. your wife there? Well, I'm, she's at the hospital. I live in South Dakota at the time. Okay. But yeah, I'm in, I'm in Wyoming in the hospital. Is she there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My mom came, I mean, I'm surrounded by family and everything, but, and at that point I, I, I made them all get out of the room. I was pissed. Your you know? family members? Yeah, everybody out of the room. I was mad. Um, had a little little talk with God and everything else. What did he say? So let me let me think of how to without getting into a long story. Basically, asked me what I had inside of me, what I have left. I got a little bit of oil. I got a little bit of determination. I got a little bit of that, and yeah, I. I it's uh, without getting really into it, anyways. Before, because you don't want to get into it, or you think we don't have time to. Both, okay. <laughs> but I mean, we can, we can. So, so the week before, I'll go back. So the week before, when I was um, doing the boiler startups at the schools and everything, living in a hotel room, you know, traveling on the road, like, which I did a lot. That was a lot of my work week was on the road doing stuff. Um, in my hotel room doing Bible study and things like that. And I don't know, I, I had a legal pad that's got like fucking pages and pages of notes, explanations of this and that, and just breaking down this little section of scripture. And it was only seven verses. Do you still have those? Yes, I do. Um, it was only seven verses and to give a long story, it was, it's about, there was this widow whose husband had died and he was a prophet and company prophets with uh, 
prophet uh, Elisha, okay? And um, he had died, and so his debtors were coming to take his sons to pay off his debt, which meant his wife was going to be kind of screwed in that time, you know, in that culture and everything. Um, so she goes to the prophet Elisha, and she says, he basically tells him the whole deal, and he goes, well, he asks her two questions. He says, one, first question, he says, woman, what does that have to do with me? And I don't think it was like a rude thing or whatever. It was more of a get your eyes off of me and onto God type of thing. And then the second question he asked her is, what do you have in your house? And there were your bayet, I think is how you say it in the original. But, and she said, nothing. It was, she, she paused. She gave him two. At first she said nothing. And then there was like a pro, pause there if you study the deal. And she's like, except a little bit of oil. And the amount of oil that she was talking about was like a pint-sized jar, probably, with a little bit of oil left into it. And so Elisha told her, you and your sons go and collect as many empty vessels as you can from all your neighbors and everything. Go back into your house and start filling those jars. And so they did. And the oil kept going and going, as the story tells in the script, kept going and going until... She tells her son, bring me another jar. And he, he's like, they're all gone. And then the oil stopped flowing. And they filled all the jars. So she went back to Elisha, told him what the deal was. And he said, sell all the oil, pay off your husband's debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. So <clears throat> coming back to the hospital, I was pissed. Laying in my I was crying. I was so pissed. Like, I, I can feel it welling up now. And, uh, I was like, why in the fuck am I here? Why did you leave me here like this? Why couldn't I have just died, you know? Which is really a sad place to be. Um, and I just heard this little voice inside me. What do you have in your bayette? Your bayette can be, your, it's your body, it's a temple, it's a house, home, depending on what context you use it. And I stopped there and I said, you know what, God? I got a little bit of oil. And he said, every empty vessel you bring before me, I will fill. So the interesting part about that is my youngest son, his name is Elisha for a reason. And Elisha, I don't know if you're familiar with the story with Elijah and Elisha. So Elisha was Elisha's mentor or whatever. And when he was taken up, he was, Elisha was given a double portion of his mantle. And my youngest, Elisha, have you seen him? He's a fucking double portion, which is what God told me when I named him Elisha and stuff. It all ties back into that same story, okay? So Elisha, he's, he's 16 now. He's fucking like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, 300. He's a man. Like, and not only is he a man, he's he's very athletic. Like, he wrestles heavyweight, and he can do fucking ankle picks, single legs, all sorts of stuff. When most heavyweights, they just tie it, you know. <laughs> very athletic. Um, just a big guy. So that's, that's one side of it that, to me, kind of, okay, this is real, you know. Another side of it, what did I do? What business did I start? TRBEDC, right? What did I do? I fucking worked with oils, selling oils and stuff. And I still believe that. And I still believe that's carrying on to Parker to fulfill all that. And that's where that's at. Yeah, but that's, um, that's, yeah, that's where that's at. And that's, that's what's, that's why I know <clears throat> when I have something that I have a problem with. If I got a little bit of oil and I work towards it and this and that and everything, I can fill that vessel. God can fill it through me. Let's back up a little bit. Okay. When I was in San Diego. So you started TRB EDC when you came out to Tennessee. After. Here. After Tennessee. Yeah. So when I was still in San Diego mm -hmm. and you reached out to me and said, hey, man, I want to go mountain bike. What kind of mountain yep. bike do you have? Where were you? I was at the uh, Center for Neuroskills in Bakersfield, California. How did you get from... Why, why Bakersfield? Because that's where the best facility was? Exactly. So I went to, um, 
I, I went to quite a few different hospitals and, and rehab places. Um, I went to Craig Institute in Denver, um, which is really like their top of the line in the world for brain and spinal cord injuries. Um, went there, had my spinal cord surgery and so forth. But when I went there, they didn't know about the brain injury, kind of like in the Leash, you know, it was like, here's the main thing. So what was going on with that? My accident happened on November 1st, 2004. Sorry. See if you need to take it. No, nah, I thought I turned my ringer off. Um, but that could be, make sure that's not him. Who? No, it's not. Okay. Um, where was I? It was uh, 2004. The injury happened. They sent you to Colorado. Okay, yeah. So went to uh, Craig Institute for my spinal cord surgery, uh, C1 through C6. And do you know what they did there? Yeah, they did a. Uh, can we pause real quick? She's calling again. Yep. All right. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, for the spinal cord surgery, they did a um, <clears throat> a laminectomy. Where and I'm not a doctor, but from what I understand, so they went in and cut the the vertebrae until they got to the hollow center where the channel where your spinal cord is, and then they you have a uh, dura. Their lining in order to keep your cerebral f- spinal cord fluid in and everything. They uh, removed a section of the dura to where they could work on my spinal cord. And then they did what's called a untethering of my spinal cord. And then took um, dura from a cadaver or a donor, grafted it in, and then they just pulled the muscles in the skin back around and staple it and tighten and everything. So... Um, <clears throat> Do you know about that cadaver? No. You don't know who it was? Or no, no. No, they don't tell you none of that? No, no. Um, yeah, so the, the spinal cord thing, so we didn't even know about that at first. Like I said, we went to, you know, uh, Center for Skills or, fuck, no. So I've seen you naked a bunch of times. Yeah. And I don't remember seeing a big-ass fucking scar on your back. Is there one? Just, Just tell me, yes or no. No, just right there. Okay, I see it. Okay. C, C1 to C6. Okay. Just my, my cervical stuff. Okay. Um, Do you know but, why I've seen you naked a bunch of times? Because you, you roofied me out of your date kit or what? <laughs> no, I used to come to work and this motherfucker oh, would be yeah. out there at 6 in the morning naked <laughs> in the front of the fucking shop with a hose. And many times I saw fucking ice cubes come out of the hose. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, you just have to test yourself sometimes. <laughs> Couldn't afford a cold plunge then. <laughs> Yeah, well, it wasn't cool then either. <laughs> Nobody fucking wanted a cold pun in but you. Right. Um, so then when I when I called you from the Center for Neural Skills in Baker, I said I went there after. Okay. So I had my spinal cord surgery. And I didn't know any of this then. Yeah. I just thought I was going mountain biking with Lance. Yeah. I uh, had my spinal cord surgery, and then I had, gosh, probably six months or so recovery of like, can't pick up anything heavier than a piece of paper and all this. Definitely other. wasn't going fucking mountain bike. Right, exactly. Um, so I had to recover from that. And then once I got recovered from that, they sent me to the Center for Neural Skills. And so I was out there and I was really just trying to find what I like because everything that I used to like, I didn't anymore. I mean, I, it, I didn't even know what food I liked anymore. I mean, put dirt on a fucking plate and hand it to me. I don't care. Was, you know what I mean? Because I couldn't smell. I couldn't. So many things were screwed up. And it was my, with my brain injuries, my front, my, uh, my front, frontal lobe mainly, which is, you know, where we develop our adult personalities and so forth and things like that. And kind of your filter, like people that don't have a filter and just say whatever the fuck, you know, type of thing. And so it, um, I really got to go through adolescence again and everything else. So I remember like at uh, Center for Neural Skills, sitting in meetings with like all my therapists and stuff and the insurance company and everything else, talking about you like you're not in the room. Well, right now he's right around an eight-year-old, you know, maturity level and this and that and the things that are, pro- and, and what, 
you know, and so every few months I might gain a year or whatever type of thing. Trying to decide if you can watch PG-13 movies yet. Right. Well, there was a, there was a point there where it looked like I might be in adult daycare, you know. And so they took me over and started doing my, uh, my rehab therapies and stuff over there with the adult daycare guys. And I thought these were some of the smartest motherfuckers around. Because they were sitting over there. I was sitting there trying to read and all this stuff. And I hear this, this group of guys over here. In 1973, you know, they're playing Trivial Pursuit. And these, and I'm getting distracted because that's a big part of the brain injury and stuff and everything too. And not staying on task. I'm like, crap, how did he know that answer? You know, this and that. But damn, these dudes are smart. I'm going to be here for a while. Because I, you know, two or three days, they're doing it and just fucking... And I finally realized they're, they're answering the same fucking questions every day. They're just doing the same. They're playing the same game over and over and over again. And I was like, I'm not fucking doing that. And so that, that, that helped light a fire too, you know. The, uh, the biking thing was because, like I said, I was trying to figure out, you know, I used to love to hike and camp and fish and all that shit. And I just didn't know anymore. And so I wanted to ride a bike well my vestibular system was so jacked up that my balance, like even this morning, you got that big down tree down there. Mm -hmm. I made myself go do that five different, five times without falling off of it to work on my balance and shit. Um, but I didn't have any balance. So I had to, I had to learn how to ride a bike again. I had to go through a bike test and everything and, and pass it and stuff to, for insurance to say, okay, if anything happens on, to him on a bike, it's okay. You know what I mean? Didn't you have a guy that was in the system with you that had actually hit his head again and reset? Yes, yes. Can so, you tell that story? Yeah, so he was an attorney. Um, he was a very, I guess, very successful attorney out in California. Um, he had had a brain injury. And I guess, I guess if you have a, a concussion or a brain injury or whatever, or, you know, on that level or whatever, that I, like, for me, I'm, I'm more susceptible to incur that again than somebody is to occur one, I guess, what they say that hasn't ever had one. So this attorney that was in there, he'd had a brain injury 10 years or so prior and kind of recovered and got back to life and everything. And then one day got up out of bed, tripped over a house slip or whatever, hit his head on the nightstand right back to square one. So... Yeah, it can it can happen, but I mean, I guess you fucking fight your way out. I don't know. So when did they? When did you get out of there? Um, How long were you there for? I think about seven months. And you went home with wife and kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember catching the snake out in the desert? <laughs> Do you remember you used to have a snake? Do you remember the next I, snake's I, name? Solomon. Little King Snake. Yep. King in Solomon. The in the barracks. Yep. Yep. Caught him out on patrol. Yep. Out in the, kept him in my cover for a few days while we were patrolling and stuff till I got back. Yeah. I remember. I remember the snake. And then you caught another, you caught this snake. You see the snake in the road. Yes. I, Tell okay. the story. Okay. Yeah. So where we're were out, you going? We were, um, it was on a weekend and we were getting out of the apartment, kind of getting out of the, the, you know, just take a break from the, the clinic and shit. And we were going up to a um, an orchard or something to go pick peaches or some shit, you know. And we're driving. There's this long ass king snake in the middle of the road, and I had on my Tevas. And so I stopped the the minivan. You're driving, or she's driving? Oh no, she probably is. I don't think I have my driver's license yet. Again okay. Yet. Um. But we stopped the van because I mean it's out in the middle of the road. Yeah. Striped, striped or banded? Banded. Black and white. Just like okay, the one that like I had. desert face. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I get out and I go up there. <laughs> and I just reach down like it was my fucking snake, like I'm reaching the aquarium. And I grab it and the thing turns around and bites me. Blood starts coming out where it bit me. And Mason's like, that's, he was four at the time. Dad, that's the most retardedest thing I've ever seen ever, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm holding I put it back down and I go, well, I guess that one hasn't been handled very much. <laughs> he doesn't remember me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, yeah, just shit like that. Like, um, 
I would go to the store to get toothpaste or something. I'd come back two hours later or whatever, no toothpaste. They're probably like $1,500 worth of crap off my credit card, you know, DVD Mm -hmm. and just whatever. Um, If we were going someplace, like if we were out in public or whatever, if you didn't keep an eye on me, I'd fucking disappear. And I didn't know where I was or what I was doing. You still do that to us. Yeah, I know. Like I said, I think that's kind of a common thing throughout my, my life. I have a lot of a lot of my friends that say, fuck, you just disappear, and then you come back, we pick up, it's all good. It's like he missed movement. He'll show up eventually. Yeah, exactly. So, but that that's where I got, I wanted to, I'm like, okay, here's something I can do. I want to go, so then I wanted to start mountain biking. And that's kind of how that came about. And so I still of, didn't know any of this. Yeah. Did you, we ever mountain bike? What's that? Did we ever go mountain? Did you ever show up in San Diego? I didn't even, no. I never really linked back up to you till I was in Tennessee. Exactly. No, no, um, we didn't. Uh, but you guided me. You were, you were telling me all about the, the mountain bike specs, what I want to look, go for D, disc brakes instead of the V brakes and this and that. And, and that's, that's where, you, no, we never did until I came out here and we went. And but, you, uh, you had messaged me and said, hey. I am going to hike the Appalachian Trail, and I'm going to hitchhike across the United States. And sometime in fucking winter, you're mm-hmm. in Nashville, and it's fucking snowing. And you're like, dude, there is no trail to get outside of, of Nashville. Like, we just couldn't, you couldn't get here. So I come into Nashville in the truck, and you got your dog with you. And mm-hmm. we, I remember stopping at... Um, the pilot gas station here or, or whatever gas station was here, filling up and then coming in and you're hanging out. You're at the shop at that point, And now I have custody of you. Mm-hmm. And I still didn't know all, like I, I didn't right. know you're like, you're giving me the data dump on the, the, you know, 90 minute drive, but I still didn't know the history. There was, you know, a 15 year gap there. Right. Um, so we got here and you take it from there. Okay. So the, uh, yeah, the Appalachian Trail thing, I had screwed up my knee hitchhiking to get there and everything, just walking to, you know, whatever. Um, screwed up my knee, and then I was going to stay here and kind of heal up and then get back on my progress, you know. And you're just like, you need to take better care of yourself. You need to do things different and better. And like you said, took custody of me, and I fucking just kind of, all right, and started learning things again. Like I said, I mean, I got to go through adolescence a couple times, you know, learning things and different deals and everything else. So when I when I linked back up with you, I had been out of the, uh, let's see, we, we linked back up in what, in 14? I, I really don't. When was that, Jeff? Because you came, that when you came in for my birthday. I think it was in 14. Best hamburger all of Tennessee. Yeah, probably 14. Yeah, at the Legany. Yeah. Um, so, fuck. I, I, Anyways. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I was. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you had just hiked across the United States. Well, yeah, I hitchhiked out I here. I picked you up in Nashville. Right. You came here. Yep. And uh, just kind of started observing you and watching. And you, well, you, you, what do you want to do, Lance? Well, I'd like to have some a little farm. I'd like to have some animals or whatever. <laughs> All right, <laughs> get in the truck. He's staying at the shop. He's. Yeah. I have an office at the shop. He's staying at the shop. Oh yeah, I'm a hobo. I'm Lan- like, Lance yeah. had always like when I met Lance. Lance came and lived at my mom's house for yep. every weekend and lived in the garage. He wouldn't. They didn't come inside. They just lived in the garage and yep. basically camped. And Lance sewed on a sewing machine next to me every fucking weekend. When he was off, Lance became my best friend. And then I met, when I met Jeff, Jeff would come down to mom's house also. And that was really the, I looked forward to the entire week. I would spend looking forward to the weekend because Jeff or Lance or somebody was going to come worth fucking hanging out to guys that were doing incredible things in my eyes. And they wanted to be my friend. Mm -hmm. So like those were I lived all week just to fucking see you guys on the weekends. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're living at the shop. Yep. In the like, we had the shop. We well, had so, the haunted house, which was not refitted at all. Right. That broke down ass house. So I guess, I guess 
how did I get to there? Is that what you're wanting to know? Like how I got from being married to fucking hitchhiking to the Appalachian Trail or? Okay. Okay. So um, my wife at the time, we went, when we were at Center for, or uh, Craig Institute in Denver, we were there uh, talking with our count, my counselors and stuff and, 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 and everything to kind of help us put our lives back together. And they just sat us down and they said, um, statistically speaking, 90% of all marriages in a divorce within one year when one of the spouses has a brain injury or a spinal cord injury, you've got both. Just saying. You know, it was kind of like. Super nice of them. And that, and that was about the best, but we want you to be aware of it, you know, type of thing. And so, I mean, we made it four years and everything, but it was, um, it was hard on her. It was very hard. I mean, we had two, when we got, when I got blown up, we had our second Parker was on the way. She was six months pregnant with him. Um, it, it was just hard because now she's got several kids to raise and the one that's supposed to be helping her do it is probably the worst one as far as that goes. Um, I put it as the analogy of she, she would get upset with me because when I was in Bakersfield at the Center for Neural Skills, we lived in a off-campus apartment. But we had, um, we had medical staff that would come to the apartment in the mornings and in the evenings to kind of see how family life was on both, you know, um, how I do with things or whatever. And, oh, yeah, so... I would go, I would make her take me in to the, to the center where I would go and do all my rehab and stuff every day. So I would go to, I would go to rehab Monday through Friday, just like going to school or something from eight to four. So I would make her take me in like at seven and I would go and work on my vestibular stuff. You know, I'd stand in front of a wall with this uh, big piece of like wrapping paper on it, like you'd wrap presents, but it would have these crazy designs and shit in it. And I have to stand there in front of it and stare at it and throw a ball, catch it in this hand. And I would do that a few times, and then I would have to go throw up or dry heave or whatever, come back and do it again. And so I would do that for an hour every day. Or that or something of that with my vestibular. Then I would go through my day of therapy, and then at the end of the day I would do another hour and work on reading or this and that or whatever. Well, the thing about it is is... Your brain requires a, a shitload of calories and energy and everything. Just normal, healthy brain, let alone taxing it and trying to create new neural pathways and synapses mm-hmm. and stuff and trying to get things to, to connect together again. So when the weekend would come and we'd have the weekend off, I was just a rack monster. I was just, that was my goal, get as much rest and sleep and everything as I could to get ready for Monday. So, you know, we, like, about seven months of that, basically. And my, my biggest goal with that was, like, because Mason was four at the time, didn't really turn five. He may, actually, he may have just turned five. I couldn't teach him how to throw a fucking football, play catch. Because just watching go through the air, I would lose it, or I would get sick, it hit me in the face, or I'd throw up, or what, you know. And so that was one of my goals. There was a, there was a big, if you took a picture of our family, and created into a puzzle, there was one big piece missing, and that was me. And so I was just trying to put it back together. Mm-hmm. But that took a very heavy toll on our relationship and everything. Um, and, and so I'd always use the, the analogy, hey, you know, because like in Recon, we'd have swim buddies, right? You got to stay right there and surf zone and everything else. I'm like, you can get out of the fucking surf. There's these plunging waves coming and this and that, and I'm hitting the bottom, getting rolled, Sometimes, you know, metaphorically speaking, sometimes I got to look for the air bubbles to figure out which way is up and everything. I said, but you can get out of the surf at any time. Well, eventually she took me up on that, you know, so, and that happened when, uh, when I got like my maximum medical improvement, you know, but she made it a lot farther than we were ever expected to. Yeah. Especially, and plus I got 10 years on her. I mean, so there was a whole different age thing, you know? Um, so that, so I went from that 
we we ended up separating, getting divorced, and she moved back to Kansas, where she was from, her family and everything, and I stayed in uh, South Dakota, and had the house stuff, but didn't have the facilities to keep it. You know, I just still doing the fucking going to the store, coming back with more, you know, right. and, and everything. Just, a- Amazon probably loved you. Right. Well, it didn't exist, but yes, I get, yeah. Um, and so I ended up losing the house and everything. And so then I lived in a van for quite a while. And I just traveled around. I had a, uh, with my disability, you got the, uh, golden pass to all the national parks and everything, you know, so I could go there and camp, get in the park for free this and that, and, and I fucking love the outdoors. So I was doing, i just pick a new front yard, like, seriously, what are you going to do today? I don't know, which way is the wind blowing? Which way you want to go? Sometimes, I, I shoot you not, I'd flip a coin, going north or south, or whatever. I mean, and just live in my van and drive around and try to figure out life, basically. And it was actually, honestly, it was probably one of the most stress-free times I've ever had. And I think that's where a lot of my... That's where I found I figured out that I could get off of my meds because when I got that and it was just Rocco and I doing stuff and stress free and not all the crap and everything else. Guess what? Some of the aches and pains started going away. Stress is horrible. Stress is a horrible killer. When you came out here, that's when you really started getting off your meds. Like you stopped all of them. Yes. <clears throat> Why? So <clears throat> because the. Um, they were killing me, honestly. How the, did you, when you came here, you went to go get your van. How did you get there? I don't remember that. How did you leave here to go back and get the van and then bring you the You bought van? me a ticket, a plane ticket. I don't, if rem- I, I don't if remember. If I remember correctly, that's how. So we took you to the airport? In Nashville, yeah. I don't fucking remember that at all, Lance. I'm pretty sure you did. And then you drove back. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then parked the van up by the shop and lived in it. For, yeah, a year or so. Yeah. yeah. And then the farm? Um, oh, yeah, the farm you bought. Well, you know why that started? Because you said food is medicine. Yeah, absolutely. Food is medicine, medicine is food. And I'm like, okay, I know where we can get some garden stuff. Yep. And you were watching, I don't know if you're watching fucking Pinterest or what the fuck you were doing. But everything was like, it had. It looks like Pinterest. Like you're like, yeah. let's get this 55 gallon drum and make strawberry towers, and let's take these pallets and put lettuce in the pallets. Like everything was a fucking Pinterest commercial. It looked like, and right. it did. It looked really good for a while, for a, for a long time. It actually looked good. And then you're like, we need to get these plants. So we went to. Do you remember? We went to the the flea market in Huntington. Okay. And we ended up coming back. We got. We went to get tomato plants, but we came back with two geese. Yes. Four ducks, three goats, two Pyrenees dogs, and six rabbits. Yeah, we started a farm. That day. Yep. And then we had nowhere to put any of the fucking animals, so we built the barnyard, which is still there. When Scully moved here, we snuck in, and we had to go up there at night um, in the dark to capture all the animals because we couldn't capture them during the day. While they're asleep, we had to grab them. And, uh, Remember we, what I just said? I was going to milk the goats and make cheese. Yeah. I ha- yeah. And then, then the, you never made any fucking cheese. You put the milk in mason jars in the in freezer, freezer and it popped them all. Yes. You Hello, were, brain you, there's, there's, that's you were lassoing saying. the goats with 550 cord. <laughs> the goat named Bob. Yes. Bob went blind. Dirk Diggler. Yeah. Dirk Diggler. Bob went blind because she got syphilis in her eyes. Yep. Do you, I don't think you were here. No, that. no, that was, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Quinn medicine woman come over. We had the goats. When we got this prop, were you here when we got this property? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we t- brought all the animals here and just released them. There was no fencing or anything. Yeah. We would just put bags of feed up by the front door, and they would just stay there kind of because there was food there. Mm-hmm. But when on a weekend when it ran out of food, the goats would wander off of the property. So the sheriff's like, hey, John, where, where are you at? The goats are... <laughs> The goats, people are calling because the goats are by the road. I go, they by the road or on the road? They're like, no, they're on the cliffs. We already chased them back. We just just wanted you to know. Yeah. Yep. So that was, yeah, that's how the farm started and everything. And that legitimately turned into this here. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. So you were here for a couple of years? One year? Two years? Almost two years. And then you went, where did you go from here? So, I went back to Kansas. Mom got cancer. Okay. So, uh, July of 2015, 
uh, she called me and got diagnosed with breast cancer again. She was, she had been, she beat it once. Right. And she was a survivor. And then, but then it had metastasized, spread everywhere and everything. So, um, and I didn't, I, when I, when I went to go help her and take care of her, I didn't realize how bad it was and everything. And I don't think she did either, you know? Um, and I, I really didn't think that I was, you know, cause mom had beat it before and this yeah. and that and go help her out a little bit. Um, and everything, but I didn't realize that I was going to be there, which and I, I'm glad I was. Sure. It was hard. It was a hard transition time in, in becoming a caregiver and everything too, but I'm glad I was because I got to spend her last couple of years with her. Um, and everything. And learned a lot from her too. And then like that woman was tough. She was a fighter. Uh, she worked until the day she died. She didn't, you know, she was 72 years old, full blown. I was draining her fucking lungs like a couple times a week, getting the fluid out of them. Um, and she was still going to work. I'd help her. I'd go up upstairs to help her get down the stairs to go to her office and everything. And I'd be on my way up there and I'd hear her on the edge of her bed. Not today. You're not fucking stopping me. I mean, just battling it out verbally, emotionally, mentally. And then she'd be getting dressed and I'm like, that's it right there. Mm-hmm. That's, that's how to do it. You know? And she did. She's and she, she, and she, I would hear her up there. You're not going to kill me. Cancer is not killing me. She fucking died of a heart attack. <laughs> I mean, so she won that battle. You know, um, but that's how that's how I ended up back there, which I'm I'm glad I did because there's a lot of, you know, it wasn't what I wanted, um, and everything, but there was a lot of good that came out of it. Uh, reconnecting with my kids, for one, meeting Alicia, establishing a relationship with her. That's another one. How did you meet Alicia? <laughs> she was in Walmart, and uh, she was working. She worked for. Um, you got like, yo, baby. No, I was kind of creeperish, I think. It's what she says, anyways. She used one of my pickup lines. No, she had shoes on. Okay. <laughs> but uh, she was, she worked for Kellogg and stock and everything, you know, and everything else. Was she in a Tony the Tiger costume? No, but that would have been fire. <laughs> that would have been fire. Um, walking by, and I'd, I'd seen her. You know, around town and this and that and everything. And You've seen her around town, huh? Right, yeah. It sounds stalkerish, right? It's a small town. Mm. And there's just the one Walmart and everything. But No, but like running and stuff. And so the whole thing was like, I didn't even really want to talk to her. And I think that's why she thought I was stalkerish at first because I went by her and then I'm like, ah, fuck, I'm going to go ask her. And so I went back to her. And then what I wanted to know was, there, is there a CrossFit gym around here? Because she was doing cross, And you could tell, you know. And, and she's like, yeah, there's one da 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 And that's how we met. And then I didn't realize it too, but she was a personal trainer. And so it was like, so I started going to the CrossFit gym and stuff and then, and everything else. And that's kind of how we established our friendship and relationship. And now here we are, we're where we are. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, there was a lot, there was a lot of good that came out of it. Um, another thing like starting TRB EDC. So how did that, what, what made you start that? The the hurricane thing and all that, or I don't even know about the hurricane. Um, thing. Well, what made me start that? Well, for one thing, Alicia. Now that I think about it, she had um, told me about. Have you ever tried using beard oil? I'm like, no. And so I got some and tried. I'm like, oh, this is kind of nice, you know. And then I got some pine tar soap, and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I like this soap. And then I just, I needed something to do. Um, Doc Larson's house had just gotten hit with a hurricane down in Florida. Okay. He needed money. I felt like that I could do something to help him. I didn't know what it was. And so I said, I, I just told myself, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to learn how to make soap. I'm going to make some pine tar soap because I really like it. Somebody else will probably like it. And I'm going to sell 100 bars at $10 a bar, raise $1,000 and send it to him kind of help him out and so i got my mom's little crock pot in her kitchen and stuff and and did some studying some research and everything and started making soap and 
sold all that, raised the money, sent it all to him. Did your first batch work? No, no. no. How many batches did you make till you had something viable? Probably five or six, at least. What did you do with the first four batches? Threw them out. Just put them in the trash? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because they just weren't, you know, trial or whatever. They just, it didn't work out. And then when you had your first, how many bars was your first run? Ten bars. Ten bars? Yep. And so where did the $1,000 come from? I made ten batches. At ten bars each batch? Yep. And a batch per three days? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I could do... The smaller batches like that, I could do like one or two batches a day. How were you selling them? Through Facebook. Yeah, through Facebook. Just to like to the attack response. You know, all the alumni and everything, that's who pulled it all, the SOE, that's who pulled together and did it all. So did you start selling your first, like as soon as you had 10 bars, did you start selling or did you wait till you had all? Oh, no, I started selling right now. I actually, <laughs> I started selling before I had 10 bars. Okay. You know? So you had no choice but for it to work. Yeah. Well, and that was the only way I could do it because I had to get money to buy the stuff to do it. And then how long were you making them? Because we linked back up. You came out to Blade Show. Right. And we put you on a table at Blade Show. Mm Mm-hmm. How long had it been from the time you started till the time you showed up at Blade Show? Maybe a little over a year. So you've been making them a year, and you showed up at Blade Show with more than one cent, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then we had Swinney there that year also, right? Swinney was doing, like, his... Um, nutrition. Nutrition yep. stuff. He was on this table. You were over I here. I believe so, yep. Was Eli there with knives yet or not yet? Not yet. Not yet. Made a lot of motherfuckers in that booth. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And that was a small booth then, too. Yep, yeah. So When did you realize that TRB was, like, a real thing? Like, hey, I can make a living doing this. When, um, probably after about year four, four and a half or five, the, uh, excuse me, the, so like I said, I sold soap before I ever had it. The way that I would get my operating money per month was I would sell private stock, which was just, I would make 24 bars. And they were usually like with a, a certain bourbon in it or something like that. Just something that I'm not going to offer to anybody else. This is just for this group. There's only 24. And you guys get the first pick. And if they don't sell out, then I'll open it up to the other ones. And so that typically got me my operating money for that month before the month hit. And so I would do that. That would buy, I would take that money and buy all my oils and everything. So I could make my private stock bars. So who were those 24 customers? Were they always the same 24 typically? Yeah. Who, where'd they come from? Who were they? Off of Facebook. Same same thing. I mean, just... Just our network guys. Right, exactly. From doing dudes. breakfast videos and this and that mm-hmm. and everything else. Um, and then I think at that point, I'd kind of had started some of my own following with the TR because there was a lot of different things. And, and the thing was, like, with uh, our soap and stuff, I mean... When people bought it, we had a first-time customer. Nine times out of ten, that was now a repeat customer. It's like, welcome to your new addiction. Well, you added other things, like you're your bitter, not better, and you're staying the right. fight. Like added, you, had, you had these motions and potions and shit, and I'm like, I'm not using that bullshit. Mm-hmm. But, like, it fucking actually works. Like, oh, you, yeah. you took, I saw you, the chemical experiments and shit you were mm-hmm. doing, um, the herbs and stuff, and, like, you were putting that somehow, like, it was baffling to watch. But it, it, once you kind of delve into it, everything's doable. But from the outside looking in, like, how would you ever make a fucking a liquid and put it in a roll-on? And where does the packaging come from right. and all of that? And uh, with the Internet the way it is, there's not such a barrier any longer. But, like, you figured all that shit out when none of that information was out there. Right, right. Yeah, like my um, my soap recipe, and so it, it's, it, none of it's on Pinterest. I didn't get anything off of Pinterest. Yeah, no shit. I saw the fucking eighty point checklist yesterday. I yeah, saw, I, yeah, yeah. I'm like, is so, all that in this? So I, I, I consider myself an autodidact. I guess. Okay. I like I like to learn. I that's one of my things. I like to learn. I like to read. I want to know what's happening, why it's happening, what cause you know cause and effect, and this and that and everything else. Um, so that's kind of how I did it. I started looking at. 
and different fats and oils. What does that do? What are the benefits of that? What are the side effects and everything? And so when I figured out what oils I wanted in my base, then I had to figure out what ratio that I wanted and everything to fit in the different parameters, cleanliness, hardliness, you know, does it lather? Does it do, you know, all this other stuff and put it in there. And, you know, once I got that figured out and, and it's a continuous thing, it's continuing to evolve, evolve. Parker has already evolved. It. Changing the recipes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and making a better product. I mean, like, like I think our, our best product or his, but hasn't been made yet. It's still to come. Mm-hmm. I mean, we got good, but as long as, you know, you keep that growth mindset and you keep growing and always looking for better ways to serve your customer, to provide a better product and things like that, you know, like my, my deal, like with the better, not bitter, the stay in the fight, um, things like this soap. I knew it worked when you gave it to Colin and Colin said it like Colin had some issues like where he's going to like active release therapy and Mm -hmm. chiropractic and stuff and like going to like pretty high end therapists and stuff for, you know, the bodybuilding industries and stuff. And then you gave him this stuff and he's like, holy shit, this really fucking works. Mm -hmm. That I'm like, whatever, crazy ass Lance. But when, (laughs) like when that shit worked on Colin and then it worked on Amanda and I I still had never tried it. I don't think I ever put it on until you put that shit on me today. Years later. Like I saw, I knew it worked, Mm -hmm. but I'm like, "Mm, I'm tougher than I'm not going to use any of that shit. Right. Yeah. I, I get it. I mean, there's a lot of that, but I think once people do use it, so like with that stuff, the, the thing that I like about that is because, and what brought that about was actually, so the better not bitter was my first thing that I ever made. And that was because I wanted to get off my fucking pain meds. And so I had to figure out some kind of solution that was natural to get me off my meds. And so again, I went to the herbal store, talked to some herbalist stuff, started researching, going to the library, getting books and whatnot, and putting all this stuff together. And that's how I developed my Better Not Bitter. And that's what I used. Uh, that was part of how I got off of all my pain meds. And it doesn't, it's not like a magic wand or whatever. I mean, I still deal with pain, you know. But what it does is it makes it, it, it Depending on the the level playing, you know, like you in the hospital to say, on a scale of one to ten, where are you at today? Type of thing, you know. Depending on where you're at in the level, if you're, let's say, if you're like at five or lower, for me, anyways, I, I if I put that stuff on, I'm not gonna fucking notice it until it wears off. It's just gonna be out of my mind. Um, if I'm kind of like above a five or whatever, I can put it on there and it kind of makes it white noise, kind of like going over to, to dim this light to a dimmer switch and just turn it. Now it's bearable. It's not so bright. It's not, I'm not squinting her, you know, and everything. And if you can do that, then it, it kind of lowers your stress. It's not, you can think about it and, and, and you, you're functional. You, you can do it, but you can still make it through your day and do things versus like, um, you know, you take aspirin, this and that. Uh, Motrin, whatever you take for your headaches or your pains or this and that. How many fucking people does that stuff kill a year? For real. And yeah. people don't know. And nobody's exactly. talking about it. Nobody's exactly. talking about it. Exactly. It damages your kidneys and this and that. I mean, you, you look at, and I don't remember the statistics right now, but um, like, I think eight out of 10 people or something like that, they're saying have kidney disease and only a couple of them know it. You know, I mean, there's just all these things going on in the background. Um, and that's the thing with the, you know, the aspirin and stuff like that. So I just try to look for a better, more holistic approach. What about CBD and CBN and, and stuff like that? What about it? It's good stuff. Does it work? Yeah. It's yeah. real. Yeah. What about guys you hear, especially like you hear a lot of vets and stuff, uh, like with marijuana and weed? Mm-hmm. Is it real? Absolutely. Absolutely. So so you have a cannabinoid. Or can that cannabinoid? Thank you. Uh, receptors in your bottom. You ha- you, you yeah, have, they're made into us. We have yeah, them. You have the why system. would we have them if you weren't supposed to use it? Thank you. Exactly. Why? Why are we not allowed to use it? They can't fucking patent it. Well, 
the real reason is because the beer companies have lobbied all the fucking congressmen to block it because if you have fucking, I mean, the the beer companies are infusing it, weed into beer now. Yeah, they're making the hops, the It's it's because of the pharmaceutical companies. And I I say I've never used weed. Right. I've never, never smoked it, never had it in me. But I truly believe that there is fucking there, something there. There is. Um, so I had never smoked it or used it until my 40s. I'm 52 now. I think I was like 42 or so. But I. Why did you? Do, why then? Why did you wait so long? What was the. Because I was a Reagan baby. What was the change though? I mean, what, oh, the right. day you decided, how did that come to be? Um, a doc, one of my doctors. Because I was trying to get off of my meds. And because the problem of it was, especially with the brain injury, if I would forget to take my meds and they hit their half-life in my system, I was fucked up for a few days. I saw you points where you literally physically were locked up and couldn't move. Yeah, exactly. For a day or two at a time. Exactly. Your dog was actually trained to be able to get the phone for you and call 911 and shit, right? He, he could open up, doors he, and shit. He could open doors and stuff. He would help me with my balance issues. You know, I could stabilize on him. So, um, another thing he could do, like, if I was disoriented and didn't know where the fuck I was, or what, I mean, because it would happen. I'd be like, you know, I could be sitting here talking, and all of a sudden, boom. I'd be like, where am I? Who, what's going, you know, stuff like that. Um, Rocco would. Do you remember when you were left Rocco at my house and you went to go get your van or something? I don't remember what happened. I had Rocco at Cedar Lakes. Okay. Smartest dog I'd ever been around. Fucking incredible animal. And the minute I opened the door, that motherfucker ran away. <laughs> and it took us three hours to get him fucking back. He was a machine. Yeah. He only listened to you, though. Right. He didn't listen to fucking oh, no, he was, he was anybody. A, he was a one-man dog, definitely. Um, but, and I don't remember where we were before that. The why the day you started taking weed. oh the yeah oh, okay thank weed. you yep thank you um so if I miss my meds or whatever it was it was a big problem even bigger problem if I couldn't remember I took them and I double took them mm. you know so there was this this huge just ups and downs boom 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 from day to day uh, chemical imbalances in my body everything else depression. And all the side effects and shit from all that stuff was starting to kick in. And I was getting suicidal and everything. And that's how I got out here. So um, I went to uh, went to the VA and got the, you know, they gave me the um, crisis awareness card and everything. It had like 10 fucking checkpoints on it for suicide. And I had like 9 out of 10. And I, and I was there and I was like, okay, I need to make some changes. And so uh, I was sitting in my room one day, and I was down, and I was fucking ready to punch out. And I was just, like, sitting there for a sec, kind of kind of doing a review of my life, things I was happy about, things that I wasn't, and things that I hadn't done that I wanted, wished I would have done. And I went, well, never, I've never fucking really hitchhiked before. <laughs> and I've never, well, I, before that I made this deal, I, I said, okay. Go do something you haven't done before, that you haven't tried. And if after that, you still feel like you do right now, green light, do it, boom. But if there's still something after that, that you haven't done that you want to do, you got to give it a shot. And so I was like, well, I'm, I, I've always wanted to like do a through hike on the Appalachian Trail. Okay. How are you going to get there? Can't leave your car at the fucking trailhead for however long, you know, and this and that. I don't know. I've never fucking hitchhiked before. Okay. There you go. Pack your shit. So I had a roommate with me at the time. His name's Lance. And so it was like, Rocco was like, this. Uh, my brother Lance, my other brother Lance, you know, type of thing. And uh, he came home to a note on the door. He still gives me shit about it. Took Rocco for a walk. See you later. And I fucking ended up here. How and many days did it take you to get here? A week, maybe? I don't know. Where's the Appalachian Trailhead? In Georgia. 
So I didn't, yeah, I didn't make it. When, when uh, you picked me up, I was camping on the side of the road in a fucking ditch. Yeah, I picked you up at that bookstore. Yeah, you know, you know where I got. Um, I went over there. I spent a day in that bookstore, and I got a book called uh, Cash Flow, and it really kind of helped me with just, just you know, mindsets and mindset stuff and everything. Um, but yeah, that's and that's how I ended up here. And then you kind of like, hey, you need to take better care of yourself and you do stuff. And then made me a farmer and <laughs> not really, but you know what I'm saying. You ready to come back home? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's the plan. Definitely. Figure it out. Just got to plan the dive and dive the plan. So why are you in town right now? What brought you here? My son's taking uh fighting, uh, fighting pistol and fighting rifle attack response. Why? Because he needs the skills. Yeah. He needs the skills. Yeah. My wife decided she wanted to make soap. Yep. Yep. And she was. Oh, that's, yeah, that's how. Well, I didn't, that's not what I, uh, where I was going with it, but she has decided that she's a, a voodoo witch doctor. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, I'm very good at it so far. Incredibly good at it, actually. Yeah. Like doing some stuff that nobody else is doing and asking questions of people that are really doing big things. And they're like. Yeah, I don't know why we don't do that. You should probably do that. And yeah. then it and then proved it out, right? Right. Like, I'm like, okay, whatever. Whatever she wants to do, whatever. But then when it really works and mm-hmm. and we've and it has worked for, you know, six months, right? Before right. she's even brought these products out. And uh there seems to be a real huge market for this stuff. Mm-hmm. So then she's like, I don't even know where the she she wanted to do the beard oil. And she's right. like, Hey, I'm like, ask Lance if you can buy the recipe right right yeah that's how she reached like, out to me and whatever the number is like whatever he asked for give him twice that mm-hmm. like whatever that is and you're like no i'll just come out and show you how to make yeah, this. so so i hadn't talked with you guys for a while i mean i've kind of ghosted everybody uh and, and not really ghosted but i'm just telling we were talking about earlier you have team training and individual training i'm a very poor friend scully mm-hmm. says that all the time about himself <laughs> And I realized when I heard him say that, I like, I'm a terrible friend, right? If you want to be my friend, you have to reach out and put in an effort to be my friend because I'm never coming to find you. And, I, and I'm kind of the same way in a sense. So I kind of isolated and stuff. I hadn't talked with you guys for a little while, you know, follow you a little bit here and there. But I'm, I'm working on me, doing my things, and, and kind of sharpening my axe for the next tree I'm cutting down. And um, got a message on uh, Messenger from Amanda about, Hey, could I get the Cox of the Wood recipe? You know, would you sell it to me? If, if the answer is no, that's fine. No hard feelings or whatever. I want to start making the soap again. She said soap or beard oil? Um, soap. So really? Because the, the, com- oil- the conversation we had had was she wanted to do beard oil. And I'm like, Lance isn't doing the soap anymore. Um, go, well, go ahead and finish your Okay. Soap. So uh, she was like, would you sell me the recipe? And so I was sitting there and I thought about it for a second. I was like, because I, it's a great recipe. It's a great blend. It's one of my favorite. But I, I nobody won't. can duplicate this. Like, even if they took it to a laboratory, right. they could never fucking nail it one for one. Right. Like, when I saw this stuff, I'm like, I, I didn't have, this was never on the radar. Like, you have shit in there that they were washing Jesus' feet with. Mm-hmm. You have shit in there that the slaves were harvesting when Jesus was on the earth and they were built like pyramid kind of shit. Like, like, you would never put this shit together. Right. Um, and it's one of my, like I said, it's one of my favorite blends, but it's your, you, you, you commissioned me, you asked me, you said, I want something that's kind of woodsy and this and that and everything, you know? And so I studied and I'd look at things and I figured out the notes for the different, to to create the scent. And I'm not, you know, it was like, no, that's John's. I'm not going to fucking make it for anything else or whatever. And, and even when. Parker got the company. He and I were both like, you know, because a lot of people are like, hey, can we get the car? No, that's SOEs. That belongs to them. So when Amanda called me, because I knew that Parker wasn't going to use it. I wasn't going to, you know what I'm saying? Um, When she called and said, hey, can we buy it? Or messaged me, when can we buy it for you or whatever? Fuck, no, you can't. You can't buy it. You don't have enough money to buy it. Here's the one kind of opportunity or chance or something where I can give you something back that you can't fucking buy. And so I said, I'll do you one better. Here's all the information. Here's all my notes from it. Here's the recipe. I will set a date. I'll come out and I'll show you how to make it. Because to me, how can I wash your fucking feet from all the times you've washed mine? So 
that's that. And so here we are. So when you started making soap, mm -hmm. and I said, hey, I want to do this, do you remember how the conversation went? I, I don't know if it's the same way you're talking about, but the thing I remember about the conversation was, you're like, I think at the time I was making 20 to 24 bars a batch at that point. And you said, yeah, I want to do some soap. And so I was like, okay, and we did it and everything. And then you, and you said, how many, how many bars do you think you can make in this amount of time? And I said something like 100. And you said, okay, I want 300. And you fucking, and again, you added pressure, pushed me to another fucking level. Because I was like, and, and I had a time frame. <laughs> so I had to start, okay. Six days. Yeah. How can I do that? How can I upscale? Boom, boom, boom. And I mean, and, and I started asking questions and getting and figuring it out and everything else. But yeah, I, that's what I remember of that. I don't know if that's how you were going to tell the story or whatever, but that's the, the portion I remember is that you said, okay, you're comfortable doing this. Let's double that. And can you make it? And, and, and then, and that just carried on into other things too. How many bars did you guys make yesterday? The day before? Uh, 85. 85. Okay, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. Something like that. It was 85. I thought you were going for 60. You guys kicked out 85 and, Half a day, probably. Mm -hmm. What was I in there asking the whole time? How many can we do, or something like that? How do we triple this? Yeah. How, how do we do twice as many in right. half the time? Like, is it even is it feasible? It's feasible. Is there equipment that exists? Like, what is the what's the process? We need more flow through the kitchen. We need a different kitchen. We need different equipment. What is the like the bigger vat? What's the answer to that? And that was always the question. And you you seemingly had the answers. I I, I do, I do. So when the when, going back to when the guys wanted to buy my business and kind of take out back or, or go after Squatch with it, um, they had the same questions: How do we do this? How do we do that? Everything else. And so I started asking this question and started figuring them out. And, and yeah, we can do it. So I I turned my batch from say twenty four bars at a time, I can three hundred a batch, you know. Um, figured out the equipment that you would need and everything else and blah, 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 blah. It, it's doable. Can we do it in the same facility or do we need a bigger room? In Amanda's? Yeah. New, yeah, you can do it in there. Or yours. Yeah, you can do it there. Yeah. So you have handed your company over to Parker? Correct. Now the, the question lies, once you go from 300 bars to, say, 1,000 bars, mm -hmm. does the market currently exist as you have your clientele base to unload that thousand bars, or do we have to grow the clientele base? We got to grow it. We got as as the uh, as it exists right now. Yeah, we need to. Here's here's the funny thing about it though. Once it grows real quick, it's going to be hard to keep up. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard to keep. Well, up. you know what the answer there is. You raise the prices. Right. Exactly. You you, you control the supply and demand. It's your comfort and, level, right? Until yep. you're at that threshold and you can duplicate that multiple times and then we can scale. It, it's ebb and flow. Right. Right. Absolutely. Like we know we can build the market. Most places right. go out of business because they can't fulfill the orders. Right. So are you going to step back in? Are you ready to step back into the business with Parker? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm helping him on a management side issue. I'm, um, I haven't been as involved as I need to be because of my health and stuff, getting back over, you know, and everything. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely stepping back in, in that, in that aspect. It's still his business. It's his company, but I'm going to be his boss in a sense. He, uh, he, well, he's young. He needs he, that. Exactly. And that's, he needs and, that. And he needs a few years of that. And so and he, he knows, he knows how to, so he can see how to solve those problems right. rather than be stuck with no, right. No mentorship there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, um, and we'll, we'll start bringing, so I'd gotten, I think the last time I looked, I had like over 300 different products that I had made uh, with TRB EDC. It's, and too, so, it's too many. Way too many. Way too many. And that's why we streamlined it down. And so. How many products are you at right now? Right now, I think he's got about 15. Now, some of that is merch. Um, he's got six main blends for his soap that he's doing. And I think for those, he's also doing beard oil to match. So you have inventory right now? Oh yeah. Yeah. So people can buy shit right now. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. At, at where? Uh, nomadicsoap.com. Where does trbedc.com go to? It should go there now that you say that. Does it? No. It should. Okay. Well, it, it can. That's I, I just never thought about that. Yeah, it can. People are still, because I'm telling motherfuckers, mm-hmm. every other night, people are like, hey, where's Lance? I'm like, fuck you, where's Lance? If you don't know where Lance is, why don't you fucking know where Lance is? Now it is your now do your duty to go to trbedc.com and buy some product. And I didn't know it wasn't redirected. Right. Yeah, go, no, it's not. Um, nomadicsoap.com. Go on there. Get your product. Like I said, it's, it's a better product than what I was putting out. And why is the name Nomadic Soap? Because um, it's kind of the lifestyle and the brand of Parker that he wants to build. So Nomadic was, um, Nomadic Shepherds and so forth were always looking for the next best pasture. And, they, and you know, obviously Nomadic moving and stuff, but they were always moving to higher ground, so to speak, always looking for the next, how can I improve this? Not only for myself, but for my, my flock as well and everything. And so that's, that's where the nomadic comes from. The um, he he he's 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 kind of, he's a mini me. In a so sense. home is where we are. Boom. Now I'm glad I asked you that because I always thought of nomadic as motherfuckers that don't want to work and they're just fucking hobos. Right. No. 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 So we need to educate the customer as to why it is called nomadic because I didn't know. So there's right. surely somebody else that sure, doesn't. Sure. So we need to do a better job of putting that out front. And there needs yep. to be the spokesperson. And to begin with, it needs to be you and him. Right. And then you transition, transition and... out slowly to where it's him. Exactly. So, yeah, like his, his tagline is, life's an adventure. Take it. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and, the, and that's what it's about. It's about like the outdoorsy mountain bike. And it's, it's, it's basically the outdoor kind of lifestyle, whether it's rock climbing, mountain biking, photography, whatever. You know, just kind of traveling that 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 holistic. It's kind of let's let's get back to life. Let's get outside of the box type of thing. So he's just delved into shoot. Mm-hmm. Does he have move and communicate? He's he's he says they're working with his moving and stuff right there and everything else. Um, but I'm sure he's he needs a lot more. You know, just yeah. like anybody. Um, yeah, he needs to become that poster boy. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Um, and it's not hard to do. No. You're going to show him or give us pointers or whatever. Well, I'm, I'm not. I don't know that I'm the guy to show him <laughs> the the movement part. I mean, there's some some younger bucks for sure in way better shape. But it, it's easy to put him with people that will put that, him. Absolutely. That's, that's what I meant. Like he's fucking, what, what is he, 18? Yep, just turned 18. Oh, yeah. You can fix, you can change that motherfucker around in six months. Yep, yep. You know that. Yep. And then the communicate, fucking, that's easy. Yeah, yeah. So that's what, um, that's what happened with TRB EDC. It got rebranded in a sense and kind of batched up. And then the other part of it, like my Better Not Bitter, Stay in the Fight, Rack Ops, um, and stuff like that, I'm 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 packaging together okay. a new brand that I'm going to be launching. Do we know the name of that brand? I got a few that I'm kicking Don't around. Don't say it yet. Until, no, I'm not. Until you have I've it. got a few that I'm kicking, but I'm not sure yet. Okay. But it's um, it'll be coming soon. You're here today is Monday? Correct. Monday is today Monday? Yeah. Today is Monday, and you're here till Wednesday? Correct. You're going to jump on the podcast with Scully and I on Wednesday? Sure. And then what? Wednesday what? After that? Uh, we're parking. I'll be heading back. Okay, and then when are you coming back here? I don't know. That's the plan. we got to get together. No, we don't have stuff. to get shit together. When are you oh, coming back it, here? Oh, that part, yeah. Uh, for uh, 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 Living Free in Tennessee. Self-Reliance Festival. Self-Reliance Self-Reliance okay. Festival, you're coming, selfrelianceFestival.com if you want to get tickets. You can exactly. still get tickets. And when is that? April four, uh, 6th and 7th, I believe, right? Yep. Is that when it is? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I got the dates, but I, yeah. I, okay. And you're going to be here? Yep. Okay. Who's going to be here? Uh, myself, Parker, and Amanda, or Alicia. Amanda oh, will you, be here, too. You, you're in a lot of fucking trouble right, right? now, motherfucker. Amanda. Alicia. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. she knows? Yep. You're retarded? Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> She's, she's well aware. What is she going to be doing here? Helping me sell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be doing some stuff. Helping Parker and I sell. Cool. So You want to make real money? Yeah, of course. Teach motherfuckers how to do what you do. Yeah. I know it, sound, it sounds fucking, I spent, I'm telling you, I spent 30 years gatekeeping. Teach people how to do what you do because they don't want to do what you do. And I got this from uh, 
there's a leather company and they have, they own a whole entire town in Mexico and they do these bags and this copy, this company had copied their bag or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they're like, Hey, we'll just show you how to do it. So they made a whole video showing how they make these leather bags. I can't remember the name. It's a really famous company too. And uh, they just showed it and people were like, yeah, I'll just buy that. I don't want to do that. Right. But they love watching. So I started doing sew videos. I literally sit down every week and teach you how to build one of my products. And we do. We get guys like, hey, I made your thing. That's super cool. Will you show me how to copy this thing? And mm -hmm. you get those dudes. Whatever. More power to them. And, uh, but the majority of people are like, oh, holy shit, I just love watching these things. And I just bought one of them. I just, I, I'm not going to go buy a $2,000 sewing machine. And, right. You know. Well, that, and that's, that's kind of funny. Like the uh, DIY, you yeah. know. I watch all I, I, of the fucking How It's Made shows. I'm not going to go do any of that shit. So I've, I've always, and you know, this like your fucking bumper that fell off. You know, it would have been cheaper to go buy a fucking bumper at Dixie or whatever yeah. and have it put on than to buy all the equipment, the tool, and then, and, you know, and then have exactly. it fall off too and everything. But a lot of times it is. I mean, yeah, the DIY stuff, it looks cool. It looks fun. But by the time you get the tools, the money, the experiment, you know, and, and yeah. everything else, you could have bought four of the damn things, usually. Yeah. I just had a conversation with a lady who was here for, for SRF. She was, you know, taking some some drone shots of stuff, how to set up the vendors and stuff. And uh, her name's Dawn, and she was here for Nicole. And I, I'd said something. She, she'd she asked about projects or something. I go, I'm only limited by money. And she goes, well, and time. I go, oh, no, if you have money, <laughs> the time doesn't matter. Because if you have the money, motherfuckers do the shit for you while you're right. doing other stuff making money. It's You're only limited by money. Right. It's not time. Like money buys time. Life's a piece of shit sandwich, and the more bread you got, the less shit, shit you got to eat. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. That's right. So um, you're moving back to Tennessee. Yep. What's that look like? Well, I don't know yet. I'm still playing, but... No, bullshit. What's it look like? Tell me. I don't know. Guide me here. I don't know what you're... Moving back, uh, looking to get some... Looking for a house or maybe some land to build on. So we went and looked at a place yesterday. Very neat, yep. pro very cool product, property. I would love to have that property, was, property yeah. but the house was just not proper. Right. Um, and you were limited by four acres, but the property was super fucking cool. Now, there's another, what was the other one, 24 or 42? It was 24. 54. 54. That's 54. a lot of fucking, yeah. 54. Yeah. Uh, looks like a bomb went off. They went through and, and cut all the hardwood. There is still standing trees, which mm -hmm. is good. That means we have shade to the ground. We can come through and cut some areas and do some have some wind blows and stuff. You know, some protection to the to the pastures and stuff. Um, equipment. We need to get over there and, and actually get on ground yeah. and see how much of it's actually swamp. It doesn't look like any is so. There's options out there. We know right. there's a ten acre property right across the road. There's a fifty two right there. Um, I lived out there in that area for mm -hmm. years. Um, it's it's a cool place. We have yeah. we have people there too. That's kind of where I where I used to live. Yeah, there, so yeah, you yeah. did actually. Yeah, so that that's pretty cool. Um, you're you're here on back on ground permanent. What five months, six months, four months? Hopefully within six. It's easy because your woman's on board. Right, right. The number one question we get is, how do I get my woman on board? And I'm like, you married the wrong bitch. Yeah, my my number one question is, is which one we're going to do and how we're going to do it? You know, like as far as right. house or just land or whatever. Right. And that's just going to take some, so I guess mainly. But you're really going to know in a couple of weeks. You're coming out for a couple of days for SRF. Right. We're going to get some on some the ground, face-to-face and -face people. Around. And yeah. a lot of it, too, is like we can look on the Internet, but most of the property here is not on the Internet. Right. And how much it costs depends on who shows up and what conversation you have with the dude selling it. Right. Yeah. That price drastically changes depending if he likes you or not. Oh, yeah. It, 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 it's, I always look at it as like an asking price. That's what they're asking. Well, when it's too. I mean, these old guys, as soon as they hear prior service, fucking recon yeah, marine. It, right. If and, they, and, man, I could not like you when I meet you and I talk to you for 10 minutes and everybody will fucking like you. Right. So, yeah, you, well, of course they will because, like, my dad used to always say there's an ass for every seat. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. So. But. Yeah, that that's that's the game plan though. Cool. Um, there's still a lot of details that need to be figured out and everything, but that's fine. We'll get them figured out. No, we don't need to figure them out. You just need to do it. All right. When I mean seriously, like when have you ever watched anything that we did here ever be figured out? I mean, maybe that's why we're a little limited. Maybe we should be way further than we are. But I mean, 
I'm, I've never. Well, it, it goes back to, you know, you can't say, well, I'm going to get all my fucking ducks in a row. This and that. They're never getting in a row. Exactly. I spent 20 years going, I need to get out of California. And as soon as we got out of California, things changed, like immediately mm-hmm. changed. Things got easier out of California. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. Well, and just being back out here in the environment, I mean, it was a, I know I've done it before. I know the, I know the pattern. I know the success. I know the, the catalyst. Yeah, it's time, it to, it's time to live again, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, yeah, completely on board with that. And so is Alicia. Good. With that. So, tired of doing the individual stuff. Good. So, absolutely. All right, I'm glad. We wrapped? We, yeah, I think, I think we're good. Is this good to stop? Yeah. We have a lot more to do. We'll do it in another episode. I'm going to go look at some land. All right. We need that new music. You got it? Trying to tell